Welcome to The Real Crime Diary, Daily Dose of Crime. What happens when a controversial medical diagnosis leads to a death sentence? Today we dive into a shocking case that could make history. The potential first execution for shaken baby syndrome in the United States. This episode will challenge our understanding of justice and medical science as we unravel a story that has left investigators, doctors, and the public questioning everything they thought they knew about child abuse and criminal responsibility. In the heart of Texas, a man's life hangs in the balance as the clock ticks towards October 17th. Robert Robertson, convicted of capital murder in the death of his two-year-old daughter back in 2002, now faces execution. But this isn't just any death penalty case. Robertson's conviction rests on a controversial diagnosis, shaken baby syndrome. For nearly two decades, Robertson has maintained his innocence. Now, with time running out, he's making a desperate plea for clemency to Governor Greg Abbott. This case has thrown a spotlight on the evolving science behind shaken baby syndrome and raised serious questions about our justice system. If the execution proceeds, Robertson could become the first person in U.S. history to be put to death based on this disputed diagnosis. The stakes couldn't be higher, not just for Robertson, but for the future of similar cases across the country. Let's turn back the clock to January 31st, 2002. It was a night that would change Robert Robertson's life forever. According to Robertson, he awoke in the early hours to a strange cry. He found his two-year-old daughter Nikki had fallen out of bed. After comforting her, they both went back to sleep. But the real nightmare began hours later. Robertson woke up to find Nikki wasn't breathing. Her lips had turned blue. In a panic, he rushed her to the emergency room. The doctor's faces grew grim as they examined the little girl. They concluded she was showing signs of brain death. The following day, Nikki was pronounced dead. The medical team noted a head injury, bleeding, brain swelling, and retinal hemorrhaging. A doctor in Dallas made a diagnosis that would seal Robertson's fate, shaken baby syndrome. Before an autopsy was even completed, Robertson found himself arrested. The speed at which he went from a concerned father to a murder suspect was dizzying. The night that began with a strange cry ended with Robertson behind bars, facing the gravest of charges. In 2003, Robert Robertson faced a capital murder trial that would ultimately lead to his conviction and death sentence. The prosecution's case hinged on the testimony of medical experts who diagnosed Nikki's death as a result of shaken baby syndrome. They painted a picture of a father who violently shook his daughter, causing fatal brain injuries. Detective Brian Wharton's testimony proved crucial. He described Robertson's seemingly emotionless demeanor at the hospital, interpreting it as a sign of guilt. This behavior, which would later be attributed to undiagnosed autism, was used to portray Robertson as cold and uncaring. The defense faced significant limitations. They were not allowed to present expert testimony about Robertson's mental lapses caused by a brain injury. This crucial information could have provided context for his behavior and decision-making. Perhaps most critically, Robertson's autism spectrum disorder, only diagnosed in 2018, went unrecognized during the trial. This undiagnosed condition likely affected how he appeared to others, including law enforcement and the jury, potentially influencing their perception of his guilt. The prosecution's narrative, combined with these limitations on the defense, led to Robertson's conviction. It's a stark reminder of how undiagnosed conditions and evolving medical understanding can impact the course of justice. The concept of shaken baby syndrome emerged in the 1970s as a way to explain serious head injuries in infants. For decades, it was widely accepted in medical and legal circles. However, as with many areas of science, our understanding has evolved significantly over time. Today, experts recognize that the symptoms once thought to be clear indicators of abuse can actually stem from a variety of causes. Shortfalls with head impact or even naturally occurring diseases like pneumonia can mimic what was previously attributed solely to violent shaking. In 2009, the American Academy of Pediatrics took a significant step by changing the terminology. They moved away from shaken baby syndrome to the broader term abusive head trauma. This shift acknowledges that injuries can result from mechanisms other than shaking alone. Dr. Andy Asnes, a pediatrics professor at Yale, emphasizes the complexity of diagnosing abusive head trauma. She stresses that context is crucial and no diagnosis can be made without extensive analysis and important background information. 
Simply observing certain symptoms isn't enough to determine the cause. Asnes highlights the critical importance of a child's full medical history in making an accurate diagnosis. This underscores a key issue in many cases, the need for a comprehensive review of all available medical information before reaching conclusions. As our understanding continues to evolve, it raises important questions about past convictions based on what we now know to be an oversimplified view of head trauma in infants. The implications for cases like Robert Robertson's are profound, potentially highlighting a miscarriage of justice based on outdated science. Now let's delve into a crucial aspect of this case that has been largely overlooked, Nikki's pre-existing health conditions. This is where the story takes an unexpected turn. According to Robertson's defense team, Nikki was chronically ill in the days leading up to her death. She had been taken to the hospital multiple times due to persistent respiratory issues and fever. This paints a very different picture from the healthy child prosecutors portrayed. The defense contends that based on reanalyzed post-mortem reports, Nikki was suffering from undiagnosed pneumonia. This condition could have hindered her ability to take in oxygen, potentially causing the brain swelling that was initially attributed to abuse. But that's not all. The defense also raises concerns about medication given to Nikki. They claim she was administered a high level of a drug that is no longer prescribed for children as young as she was. This raises serious questions about whether the medical treatment she received might have contributed to her tragic death. These factors weren't adequately considered during the initial investigation. The focus on shaken baby syndrome seems to have overshadowed Nikki's complex medical history, potentially leading to a grave miscarriage of justice. In a stunning twist that could reshape this case, Detective Brian Wharton, the very man who once testified against Robert Robertson, has had a profound change of heart. Wharton, who played a crucial role in Robertson's conviction, now believes that no crime was actually committed. What led to this dramatic reversal? Wharton admits that his initial interpretation of Robertson's flat effect at the hospital was misguided. He now understands that there could have been other explanations for Robertson's demeanor, including his undiagnosed autism spectrum disorder. Moreover, Wharton says he's gained a better understanding of Nikki's medical history and diagnosis since the trial. He now regrets not having more information about her health conditions at the time of the investigation. In a powerful statement, Wharton declared, I owe Robert nothing less. He feels a moral obligation to speak out in Robertson's defense, driven by his lifelong commitment to truth and justice. This unexpected turn raises critical questions about the case. Could Wharton's newfound perspective sway Governor Abbott's decision on clemency? And what does this reveal about the potential flaws in the original investigation and trial? With the execution date looming, the fight to save Robert Robertson's life has intensified. A diverse coalition has rallied behind him, creating a groundswell of support that spans political divides. Bipartisan groups of state legislators have joined forces, setting aside their differences in a united call for clemency. Medical experts have also stepped forward, lending their voices to challenge the outdated science that led to Robertson's conviction. They argue that our understanding of head trauma in infants has evolved significantly since 2002 casting doubt on the original diagnosis of shaken baby syndrome. But the clock is ticking. Robertson's legal team is working tirelessly, submitting a clemency petition to the Texas Board of Pardons and Paroles. This board holds the key to Robertson's fate, as they must recommend clemency before Governor Abbott can intervene. The pressure is mounting on Governor Abbott, who has used his clemency powers sparingly in the past. Supporters are urging him to consider the new evidence, the changing science, and the growing doubts surrounding Robertson's conviction. This race against time underscores the high stakes of this case. If clemency is not granted, Robertson could become the first person in U.S. history to be executed based on a shaken baby syndrome diagnosis, setting a precedent that many fear could have far-reaching consequences for similar cases across the country. As we wrap up today's episode, it's clear that Robert Robertson's case is more than just another death row story. It's a pivotal moment that could reshape our understanding of both criminal justice and medical science. If Robertson is executed on October 17th, it will mark the first time in U.S. history that someone has been put to death based on a shaken baby syndrome diagnosis. This fact alone underscores the gravity of the situation and the far-reaching implications of this case. The evolving science behind shaken baby syndrome, now more broadly termed abusive head trauma, raises critical questions. 
How many other convictions might be called into question? How do we balance justice with our growing medical knowledge? Moreover, this case highlights the crucial need for thorough investigations that consider all aspects of a child's health history. It reminds us that in matters of life and death, no stone should be left unturned. As we await Governor Abbott's decision on clemency, we're left to ponder, what does justice truly look like in a case like this? And how do we ensure that our legal system keeps pace with scientific advancements? Your thoughts on this matter are important. We encourage you to share your perspectives and continue following this developing story. The outcome of Robert Robertson's case could set a precedent that affects countless future cases and lives. Remember, in the world of true crime, it's not just about the stories we tell, but the questions we ask and the changes we inspire. Until next time, stay curious and stay informed. Power, Pleasure, and Pain A Study of Abuse Through Time this book provides a detailed examination of how sexual violence and power dynamics have manifested across different historical periods from ancient civilizations to the modern era. It explores how figures in positions of power used their influence to manipulate and exploit others, showing that the patterns of abuse we see today have deep historical roots. Many people struggle to grasp why abuse of power, particularly sexual violence, persists in modern society. By connecting historical events with contemporary cases, the, the book offers crucial insights into, into why such behaviors remain prevalent. The book analyzes infamous cases such as those of Harvey Weinstein, R. Kelly, and Dominique Pellicotte, drawing parallels between them and historical figures. This section highlights how the systemic abuse seen in recent times is not a new phenomenon, but part of an ongoing cultural issue. Through the lens of these modern examples, readers will gain a better understanding of how institutions, wealth, and power have historically shielded perpetrators from justice contributing to their ability to, to continue harming others. The book explores the philosophy of libertarianism, particularly through the works of Marquis de Saïd, to explain the disturbing ways in which pleasure, power, and cruelty have been intertwined. This provides readers with a deeper philosophical context to to interpret modern-day scandals. Unlike other studies that focus solely on historical or, or contemporary cases, this book uniquely blends both, offering a full spectrum of how abuse is tied to power dynamics. It stands out by making philosophical connections that help readers understand the deeper societal issues at play.